This is a spider cone alaka. I've done a couple of videos on it already. I want to give a bit of an update. I've done another round of cardboard cutting on it, and it's coming out solidly as a class 2 steel, showing relatively high edge retention for extended work on abrasive materials taken to a relatively low sharpness. There's much more information on that down in the description. Now initially when I used this, it showed damage relatively easy on um, light work, cardboard, light plastics. I suspect that that wasn't due to the extreme edge profile, which is around 5 degrees per side, because it's a continuous grind. There's no actual secondary or transition level. But because the edge was actually overheated in use, and most likely water or rapid quench to cool it down, which probably microcracked it. To test that hypothesis, I just sharpened it a bunch of times and kept repeating the work, and of course as I sharpened it and repeated the work, the edge got more durable. And it's like the fact, and right now it's at the point where it easily carves soft woods like pine, and can even do end grain cuts. Similarly, it can do moderate woods like bass woods, and again, even do end grain cuts. Uh, the edge limit durability right now uh, appears to be around plywood and OSB, or any kind of knotty wood where you use it relatively high, say around 50 pounds on a push cut, and you will get damage to the edge that you can see around, uh, say, one thousandth of an inch. Not heavy, but I mean you can see uh, one thousandth of an inch, you can easily see by eye. Now, uh, why is that the case? This might confuse a lot of people because um, high carbide steels, and especially powdered metallurgy high carbide steels, are often described as being very tough and unfortunately they're not tough in the sense that you would think compared to other steels. When you read some of the metallurgical descriptions and information provided by the suppliers and manufacturers you have to understand the context that they're putting it in. So when they take a steel and they say uh, for example uh, CPM M4 is described as a very tough steel they're comparing it to other high-speed steels and the particle metallurgy process uh, makes the carbides more uniform and takes away the large asymmetry in the carbide axis, which means that the toughness is more uniform in various directions through the steel. Steels all have a grain because they're rolled and normally when you cut a knife you cut it so that the grain runs actually very similar to the actual uh, handle, the grain runs from tip basically to the end of the handle so that's the direction of the grain. And the reason why you wouldn't run the direction of the grain from spine to the edge is because, like anything else, steel will break through that grain, just like it will in wood, much easier. Uh, powder metallurgy steels uh, have a much smaller difference between the toughness when you test it both ways. So, for example, if you were to make this knife and run the grain from here to here, and then run, make it and run the grain from spine to edge, you would find the one from spine to edge was drastically less tough by a factor of maybe say one tenth. Powdered metallurgy steels are not nearly as drastic as that. They may only be say 25 to 55 percent less tough uh, than when ran the other way. So these are the kind of things that when you read on the manufacturer and spec sheets mightn't be immediately obvious, but that's what they mean. They mean toughness in comparison to, not toughness in a general sense. So back to this. Now why is the edge breaking apart? Uh, it's obviously a very hard steel, it's very strong, uh, and you're not really subjecting it to an impact. You're not smashing it off something hard, so there's no violent chipping or cracking involved in it. It's obviously a strength issue because it's being loaded very slowly. And that's the inherent difference between strength and toughness. If you don't quite understand it, it's very easy. To understand the difference between uh, strength and toughness, one of the easiest materials to think about is concrete. Why? Concrete is extremely strong. If you cast concrete, you can put enormous weights on top of it and try to crush the concrete down. It won't do anything. Concrete is very, very strong. If you take a hammer, even with a light pop, you can break concrete. How come? It's not very tough. Inside the actual concrete, or inside any material, very different things happen when you put force on them slowly versus when you put force on them quickly. When you put force on a material relatively slowly, inside the material can adapt to that force the crystal structure can actually change. Parts of the crystal can slide past other parts, different bond lengths that can actually expand, crystals can pull apart. It takes time, however, for these things to happen. If you apply the force very, very fast, you're applying it so fast that the crystal structure can't actually make any changes to itself and it splits apart. Now, if that seems a bit too vague, 
Now, as a more direct sort of example, uh, a very common game around here that people play when they're kids is called Red Rover. And all you do is you take a bunch of people and they get together, say 10 people, and they all hold hands, they interlink like this. And then someone else stands away, runs at them, and tries to break through the line. Now, if you think about it, when you're holding hands with someone, you can have a very strong grip, very strong, very tight grip. But when someone hits that relatively fast, they can break through. How come? Because they're not really fighting your strength. They're fighting your ability to adapt to the force that you're putting on them, which is why the people that will actually win in Red Rover are often not the largest and the biggest people because they don't move fast enough, but the very small and very fast people who can basically run and then throw themselves at the line. And what happens is they hit right where the people are holding hands, but they hit it so fast that you don't have time enough to adapt to the actual force and it breaks it apart. Whereas if a great big guy hits it relatively slowly, you'll actually see the whole line of people adapt and the force spreads out right through the whole people. Same thing happens in steel. So when you flex a piece of steel like this, you're applying a force relatively slowly. And the steel itself can adapt to that. You take the same piece of steel, bam, hit it with a hammer, you're not giving the steel any time to actually react internally like that chain of people did, and bam, it can crack apart. So what's actually happening at the edge of this knife? And why does it happen in regards to high carbide steels and not lower carbide steels? I've made a few simple models. I should show you sort of the drastic difference between these two blades. This is the edge of the Nalaka at around a thousand times magnification. This is done to scale. This is the edge of a more sort of traditional knife at around your 20-25 degree per side angle. And you can see the massive difference this is in the taper. Extremely different. Now, keeping to the same scale, about one in a thousand, this penny is actually the size of a cluster of carabides in S30V. Again, at a scale of around one to a thousand. Now, assuming this is the edge of your standard knife, you can see you can easily put this great big cluster of carabides anywhere and you can go really, 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 really close to the apex before you start having a problem. You can almost get all the way out here and you'll start having a problem because of course now this big chunk of carabides is actually bigger than the actual apex. And what happens then of course is that the carabides will get cut during the sharpening so this will actually be reshaped. But of course if you have a great big chunk of carabide there's no longer any steel around it. It's very similar for example uh, when you're mixing cement, you can't actually mix cement thinner than the actual aggregate or rock size that you put in it. What happens if you try to make a strip of cement an inch thick and you have inch sized rocks in it? It's very difficult to actually form it. You'll see the rocks randomly sticking up out of the cement and the cement will be very, very weak because there's no actual cement. You can have a rock going from one side to the other and of course it breaks apart at the rock. Very similar. If you've got big pieces of carabide that are as thick as the actual piece of steel in that area, the carabide will pop out. But just look how close you can get to the actual edge before that has a problem. You're right on top of it. Well, look what happens with the Nalaka edge. You can only get to about right here. So to just compare them side by side, you can get all the way right out here on your basic everyday 20-25 degree knife before you start having a problem. Right out there is where you can get with the big piece of carabide. So that's of course is where you'll start having issues. If the edge is going to break around the carabides, that's where it breaks off. You can only get right out here with the, the Nalaka. If you go any further, you're again, the carabide is bigger than the steel. So the Nalaka will start to break off way back here and all this will just crack right off because it will crack off around the carabides. So uh, that's one of the reasons why generally high carabide steels will tend to benefit from greater edge angles because the greater edge angle stabilizes the great big piece of carabides in the steel. Whether when you're trying to put a really fine angle on a knife, you go with uh, a finer or a smaller carabide. Uh, now, there are steels that have uh, carabides which are uh, a tenth of the size that are in the Nalaka. One of them, for example, is a EBL 13C26. So, now, what kind of steel would you actually want if you wanted to make an angle like this have the sort of stability in relation to carabides as an angle like this has in relation to S30V? Well, you need to just reduce the carabide size. And a steel that does that would be, for example, AEBL. Um, this, again, keeping to the same scale, it's even very hard to see. This little tiny piece right here, that would represent 
the size of the carabides, again, keeping on the same scale. So again, S30V, ABL. Now, watch what happens with this little tiny thing. I can put this little tiny thing, it's even harder to see, but I can shove that up almost right to the very edge before it starts running out of room. So I can get this little tiny thing same distance as I can get. So if you have this profile in AEBL, the edge will start to break or snap off to the same distance, and that's what you're going to see when you look at the knife, that the carabides will crack off in this great big angle. And that's one of the main benefits of using very low carabide steels, that they allow you to maintain that very thin cross-section without getting into carabide issues. Now, of course, if you are not actually using very thin cross-sections, or you're using a much lower grit finish, uh, which leaves the edge much thicker, the apex, uh, you won't see a benefit to low carabide steels, and you should use a higher carabide steel anyway to take advantage of the wear resistance, assuming uh, you're not going to have toughness or grindability issues. So, back to the Nakala. Now, if you want it to actually be able to handle plywood and OSB and sort of not your woods, you're going to actually need to thicken up the edge bevel and put a secondary bevel on it. If you thicken the edge up to around 5 thousandths, you'll have an edge which is relatively durable meaning that you should easily be able to push cut all those woods. And I didn't thicken it up on the Nakala directly, because it would be too much work to grind it back off, but I had done it on a number of other knives, including ones in S30V. So around 5,000 gives you enough thickness at the edge so that you can push cuts through all those woods. At around 10,000 on the edge, the edge is not thick enough that you can sort of twist it a little bit. And at around 15,000, it becomes that thick that it's very, very difficult to break the edge out. Uh, unless you're deliberately trying to or you're exceedingly strong because you're basically having to cut the knife right into something and violently snap it like this. Other than that, 15 thousandths is very, very durable. So now, I mentioned that I wasn't going to thicken the edge on this. I'm not going to do it for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, the edge on this right now is around 5 degrees per side. There is no secondary or transition bevel. It goes from spine straight to the edge. I'm liking this for a number of reasons. Number one, because the edge bevel is so fine, it forces me to focus on technique and precision and control when I'm cutting. And that's a very good thing. Because it forces you to gain experience, it forces you to learn, and it forces you to adapt and put more thought into how you're using the knife. Uh, so you learn from that. The other thing is, of course, the cutting ability of this is very phenomenal. Uh, because the angle is so low, for any shallow cutting, it does very well. If it's on cardboard, woods, plastics, foods in the kitchen, uh, and even for various craft work in and around the house, the needle uh, type uh, point on it is exceptional. And for any kind of uh, health issue, like for splinter cuttings or even uh, small issues where you've got a cut and you're trying to trim up dead skin, again, you have a needle type point, uh, lances for uh, boils and that types of thing. Very nice knife, very useful. Keeping in mind, like I said, it does have that durability limit on plywoods, OSBs, and knottier type woods that you can, if you twist the knife around, again, the edge will be uh, a bit less durable. Uh, in the kitchen, I've also found it to be superb as a pairing or utility type knife. The only time where it really starts to be a drawback is because, as you can see, the spine is a bit thicker. It does, however, taper very nicely towards the tip, and it has this very nice swedge, which thins it out a bit more. So using the tip itself is relatively nice. But for thicker cuts and vegetables, like for carrots and stuff like that, you'll notice it will fall behind dedicated kitchen knives. It's a decent pairing knife from uh, Wilshire, which has the titanium nitride coating. This is your sort of uh, Japanese-style uh, Henkel's knife, where they've tried to blend the sort of new and the old together. Very nice kitchen knife. And this is one of my favorite uh, knives. This is a large chef's knife from uh, Henkel's. This is their economy line, just plastic handle, but very nice, very solid blade. So it's not going to be able to perform with them in terms of doing deep cuts, because again, they're much thinner uh, stock. But uh, outside of that, for shallow cuts, it works very well. And a couple of other things. It has a very deep ride clip, which is rather nice, so it doesn't stand out very much in your pocket. And you can carry a knife without having it being, you know, uh, oftentimes not having attention on it when you don't want it. But the other nice thing about this is that this doesn't come across as tactical or violent or weapon-like, which is rather nice. This looks like wood, and it has sort of a boxy or rectangular shape. And it obviously looks like there's a bit of tradition, there's a bit of culture, or something associated with this. And... That, again, spoke uh, a bit of a conversation point, and to me it's kind of interesting to have it for that number of reasons. So when you're talking about using a knife or when you want to use a knife or show someone a high-quality knife, there's lots of things you can talk about conversation-wise in this. Lots of little features the spider cut put in it, like little jimping here to actually allow you to catch the liner lock a bit easier when you're opening it and when you're closing it. 
So I've been carrying it just um, as a regular uh, utility knife and using it in the kitchen for the last couple of weeks as well and really liking it how it comes out uh, for those reasons. It never would replace, I don't think, something like the paramilitary uh, for regular carry. Uh, I'd want to have at least one other knife on me, like I said, that had a bit more edge durability to handle that uh, heavier work. But as a large sort of gentleman's knife, it works very well. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, conversation piece. And I'd have to say again, have to give respect to Spyderco for doing such an extreme geometry on this knife. And for anyone who wanted to see limits of sharpness, limits of cutting ability, um, this is one of the very few knives out on the market now that has an edge uh, in this profile. I mean, this is thinner and more finely ground than even customs by Phil Wilson. And um, so it sets a relatively high standard, very interesting piece.